now let's really move on to the interactive session. So thank you very much, Sabine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so our interactive session is called A Whitehead's Guide to P-Hacking. And uh, as the name already really reveals, it's an interactive session. So feel free to ask questions. Uh, you can either raise your hand or speak or use the chat box. And our instructor today is my colleague, Senia Deliciani. She is an engineer with more than 10 years experience in MRI research. She is experiencing a broad range of topics involving MRI development with focus on muscle MRI. And she has done sequence programming, data post-processing, and also statistical evaluation. She has a diploma in electrical engineering, a master degree in biomedical image science, a PhD in biophysics, and an advanced certificate in applied statistics. So please welcome Xeni. <laughs> thank you, Claudia. Thank you for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for this invitation. I feel pretty humble to talk about all the amazing speakers that are invited in this symposium. Uh, for sure, I'm not the most knowledgeable person about statistics here, but I know a lot about mistakes that we do in our field, and uh, that's what I want to show you how to avoid them. So can I share my screen? Uh, can you see? Claudia? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I will try to be a bit faster. What uh, what we will do is I want to start with uh, a few slides and then we will move on to the GitHub page. Uh, so uh, as Claudia already mentioned, this is a guide of how not to do the hacking. And you can later follow me in the link that Claudia took kindly put in the chat. Oh, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So, now to get us started, did Columbus actually discover America? As uh, Professor Sen once said, according to the article mentioned below, no medical statistician would ever accept that Columbus discovered America because he, he never really went to look for it, did he? And uh, the point is that we shouldn't really do a research like Columbus did, or if we do, we should tell we are doing it. Um, what it took me a long time to discover and what many people still don't realize in our field is that there are different kinds of research. There is exploratory research and confirmatory research. And uh, what most of us often do is we use the techniques of one to do the other. And this leads us to a lot of uh, mistakes or inflating our data results. So by exploratory research, we usually mean that we do small and flexible experiments. We don't really have a hypothesis or maybe we kind of have one and we change the order of our experiments on the way or some details, we change MR protocol parameters. And that is fine if we are clear that our goal is to generate a new hypothesis from our data and to find the unexpected. And that's the beauty of exploratory research. But most of us do exploratory research and we call it confirmatory research. Instead, confirmatory research is supposed to have a clear hypothesis and then we collect data that they may support this or may not support this. And our goal is to be to minimize the risk of false positives. But enough with the theory um, that you have heard a lot of interesting before about. I will now move to the binder page and you can follow with me from the Zoom screen or you can actually open the page and run the script yourselves. Uh, the point is that this is a material you can later use to play around with the variables, learn a little bit about R and uh, change the parameters and see the effect on your graphs. So I will uh, slowly go through and we will go back to the slides later for some conclusive remarks. Uh, can you all see the GitHub page? Is it too small? Is it fine? It is a little bit small actually. Uh, no? It is better. Okay. 
so uh, this uh, tutorial is created in the general concept that we start from bigger distributions and then we plot the results or we sample just some points from these distributions and we uh, experience what happens if we only have some points. So um, to start with, I have prepared some examples of plots and tests about uh, two very ideal distributions. So the, um, the idea is that we um, did our experiments, we had the previous hypothesis, and then we collected uh, some uh, imaginary data, let's call them QMR values, and we have a thousand of these values for um, from uh, control subjects and thousands from patients. And our hypothesis that we have uh, a lot of clues to support it is that the patient values are higher than the healthy volunteer ones. Uh, so this code is written in R markdown and the point of the story is also to introduce you to these environments that are uh, very nice tools for analysis. Uh, so I will also give a brief introduction about some commands. So the, the introductory part of the tutorial uh, uses these two very ideal distributions that here are preloaded from the data on the page, but you can uh, go back and create the normal distribution yourself. As you can see here, it's now that we put the mean value and the standard deviation and the number of samples. And we have one nice distribution around 10 and one around 40. These are purely fictional values. And we have uh, one column with data and one column with our tags. That's usually how the data sets in data frames in R are structured. And we call them patients and control. So this is a beautiful ideal case. And uh, here I have already plotted the result. Uh, later, you can go back and change these values and see how your graph look. And I use the gplot library, that it's a very nice library in R for, to make plots. Uh, what I want also to bring your attention to, not uh, directly applicable, is that I use uh, Viridis color map because uh, color maps are important also for colorblind people that they can see the colors the same. Uh, and uh, see the same differences as we do, something that we usually neglect. And uh, in brief, we have uh, our control values and our patient values. We have the histograms. We see these two distributions are even without any kind of test. We see that they are far apart. There are a lot of samples and uh, also plot the difference. Uh, this is a plot we don't usually use in our field also because we don't usually have many values, but it's, uh, it's very useful to have a look at. And uh, what uh, we usually do, and uh, we do more than we should, is uh, uh, box plot visualizations. As we see here, we load the same value to the plot and we use the box plot visualization. Uh, we have our X, our Y, uh, we fill our colors. And uh, here, I, since I have uh, a lot of points, I, I chose not to do it, not to plot the, the space like this. Oh, the beauty. Oh. And not to plot the specific points, but uh, because they are, many and uh, they would uh, create a cloud of points. Oh, but uh, uh, what I wanted to bring your attention to is that we... No? that we have a tendency to use um, to, to use box plots for any kind of, uh, uh, of, 
uh, number of points and, and this is wrong because I, I will just shortly move to to her to show you this. Uh, because if we have less than 10 points, uh, box plots can be very tricky. Instead, if we have many points, like in this case, I load my thousand points, this is a more trustworthy uh, way of visualization. And we see again the, our patients and our controls, how nicely far apart they are. I'll try to move back to the page. Uh, so what I do here, and it's just an example, I'm still at this ideal case that my subsets are, my distributions are very far apart, and I choose to save a small subset of this data, there are just eight samples per distribution, so eight patients and eight controls. No? Okay, let me reload. Uh, what I, I want to show is that uh, we very often work with, uh, with a small number of data sets and this can be very dangerous and we should be very humble about our results. And is that most of the times we make claims because we have to, to publish, and we should be more careful with this. So here is a, a subgroup of the data sets we had before. These are the control values, these are the patient values that they are higher. And uh, what we would very often do in a vacation is we would uh, go ahead to do a t-test. Even if uh, in this case we have um, uh, checked all our assumptions because we have normal distributions, and this is something we very often ignore, we should have normal distributions to do a t-test. And uh, uh, we should, uh, there are many things, uh, if we really want to use it, there are many things to define, such as the DM value. So here I test whether the, my, my hypothesis is whether there is no difference between the distributions or some difference. And my, since this value is zero, I don't have it here, but it could have one. I, I assume they are independent, so paired is false. But this is another thing that has can have a huge effect. And also it's a two-sided test. That's also very important, the confidence layer and the variation, because usually the standard assumption of a t-test is that the variations are equal of the two distribution. And in general, we what we very often see is that even if people have a reason to do a t-test, they completely ignore all the assumptions. And uh, this is something we, we should be more careful about. Okay, hopefully this is loaded again. Okay, and here we see these two very small distributions and we see that since my data are so far apart, we, we have a very low uh, p-value. What I also wanted to show you is that we, we tend to, as the, the speakers before mentioned, we tend to only use p-values. And this is not only wrong and dangerous, but it's also, and we present less than we actually have. And this is really, really sad about some of the fact that it's wrong, because even here, from the t-test in R, we don't only have the p-value, we have the estimates and the confidence interval and the t-statistics, and all this is really useful information. So uh, uh, the last part of this introductory part and something you can experiment with later is um, I, I take these uh, two big normal distributions and uh, inspired by the YouTube video of Professor uh, Jeff Cumming at the Dance of Pivarius that was also mentioned before. What I do here is I, I sample, let's say, well, here I can sample 100 points per distributions, and then I do a t-test, and I repeat this process many times, and I plot the p-value. This is a very ideal case, so I, I, I keep getting very good p-values, but if I would say I would have five samples per distribution, 
then even in this ideal case, I see some values that start coming out. We say it gets really. And uh, you may think five is a ridiculous number, but uh, we should be honest that uh, that's what we see in our field very often, that we have very low numbers and we do explore the research and we see on doing t test and these are situations that we really have and we should, yeah, that's true, that's interesting. We should be more careful and we should definitely report more than the p-values. So uh, I will try not, I'll try to, to move ahead smoothly. I, I summarized the biggest problems we have with t-test in our field in five categories. One is that numbers count and we usually analyze five samples and we describe them as like they were 500. Uh, and this is problematic. So uh, in this first example that you can also choose to go through alone, I create two normal distributions again. You see here the uh, norm command. Uh, in R, it's very important to set the seed, like set the starting value of my random creation of distribution. Otherwise, every run creates kind of different results. And uh, I define the mean values that are closer together. And I also increase the standard deviation, but to keep the assumptions right, I think simple. I choose that the standard deviations are still the same. And this is how it should be, or otherwise I, I should mention. So uh, let's say if I run this with 1,000 samples, I, I get the p-values. I You see, these are the two distributions that are much closer together, and I see it here. But if, like we usually do, I say in Boxprod, I have a completely different view, and I don't really realize the situation. And uh, if I have so many as 1,000 samples, this is wonderful. I still get a very small p-value. But uh, if I go and run it again with 10 samples, then the p-value is much smaller. And if I run the same command another time, this is Sorry. I'm not really used to I prefer my yard environment. But, uh, so the, this is still very little. And, um, and here you can have a, a view of how the distributions look like. But what's really fascinating is if you go and repeat the procedure that we did before. So uh, from these uh, thousand samples, choose like five per group and keep repeating this. And then you see that things become tricky because yes, I do have some significant values, but I have many more values that are uh, far not significant. And, uh, and what we should really do and what was mentioned very nicely before by Valentin is that we we shouldn't restrict our reporting to the p-values. We should uh, have graphs, either box plot, skater graph. We should, uh, and a nice way to, to solve the problem with the box, box plot is uh, as a minimum plot your points on the box plot. So we should have the, the right graphs and we should report not only point estimates, but confidence intervals. And if it's, a really correct analysis, we should have done also a power analysis and have our sample size. Um, what I have here, and I won't talk too much about it because of the time, is that uh, if we run a pre-analysis, then we can nicely uh, calculate the, um, the effect size. And this helps us to, to, to show the magnitude of the difference. And with this, we go and calculate the sample size that we actually need for our confirmatory analysis. Uh, yes, we are going to, yeah, Giovanni, we are, we are this is our next, uh, uh, I will reply your first question and the other one later. Uh, so the, your point about alternative distributions is my next point. 
But uh, what we usually do is that we analyze everything like their normal data. Instead, there are other tests that are uh, uh, more appropriate for not normal distributions or for distributions with uh, less symbols. And these are one option are non parametric tests, for example. And uh, uh, we should be aware of those other tests, and we should be aware that. Uh, if we don't have many samples, because if we do have many samples, we reach normality. If we don't have many samples, and if we have skewed distributions, then we should use other tools. And as a minimum, we should visualize our samples, because that's something also that we don't usually do. And it's the first and the most important step in analysis. So what uh, this second example have, I, I based on two exponential distributions, I created one distribution for the patients and one for the control. They, are, they have as a basis an exponential function with some factors and uh, uh, additions. And uh, you, you can start with 1,000 samples and keep uh, simulating what happened if we have 100 samples, and then also do a, a t-test. And as we see, the t-test really gives us a very low value, but it, it's also because it's not the most appropriate test. So what uh, you can do by running the code below is, uh, as before, First of all, I have introduced the second test, that is the Wilkinson test. It's uh, um, uh, often called Ma Manuitne. There are many different opinions there in the literature. The point is that it's a non-parametric test, and it's more appropriate if we don't have many samples or if we don't have normal distributions. So this is still a two-sided test here, and I compare the p-values uh, of this test and of the t-test. And we can do the sampling population and testing uh, experiment also many times. And we also see that we do have some, the, the lower I go with the sample size, uh, the more variation I have in p-values. In effective size, however, we don't have, we always have less variation, but it's something to keep in mind. And we see that since the Wilcox test is more appropriate, it, uh, when we have many samples, it's gives a kind of more optimistic uh, view of our uh, differences. So it's uh, it's important in any case. So, well, already uh, uh, the, my take home message here is uh, look at your distributions. They may not be normal. And uh, uh, the third point that uh, I want to, to mention a bit more extensively, and that's important, is what we often do is that uh, we do an experiment and the p-value is 0, 0, 49. It's almost good. And then we say, OK, I have time. Let's do scan two more people and see what happens. And then our p-value is perfect, and then we can publish it. And either adding or removing points at this point is completely wrong. And, uh, we should be uh, conscious about it. So uh, in this example, I have uh, preloaded uh, a data set where the, if we compare the p-value, this is x limit, is close to 0 0.05. And then you have the option. What I do here is I take this data set and uh, let's say I scan uh, two colleagues from the office and the pay or a pay sent an colleague, and I so I add two more values. What harm can they do, right? And uh, we see here these are the data with the two extra points, and these are before. We don't see so many differences, do we? But the, the difference is a difference uh, as we're used to read the results. It's an important difference because before we had 0 0.05 and then we had a clearly significant result. And uh, that's another point why we shouldn't uh, just mention the p-value, but uh, uh, really saw the complete image of our results. 
Uh, another thing that we tend to do is to remove values that our results look uh, almost okay if we remove that value, so we just remove it and we convince ourselves that we removed it because the exclusion criteria would be this and that. Uh, uh, but this is another thing that is completely wrong. So uh, again, here I have uh, two, two different distributions, one with the outliers and one without. And uh, we see just with a few points how the p-value results differ. Here is my, one of my outliers. And uh, visibly, the, if I would just judge from this uh, box plot, I, I would be more humble about my results. Instead, if we go and report the p-values, we have a tendency to be much more absolute. And uh, I have uh, two more points that I want to briefly mention. In this um, fourth result, I use a, a data set or sub data set from R. What is very nice about R is that there are some uh, data sets ready to, uh, ready to use, ready to test. Uh, and uh, that's what uh, I did here. I use some flower data sets. And uh, so this, uh, this could be, however, any data sets from our field. Here we have the, the species of flowers, the sepal length, the petal length. And, but uh, imagine this could be uh, uh, some results about MR where we test for, I don't know, age and height and uh, size and uh, and we, we do that, we see sometimes tables where we test about everything. So uh, what we would do is we, we wouldn't see this test, 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 but we would see the tables and p-value this, p-value that. And uh, what we should be aware of is that the more we test, uh, the more probable is that we have at least a p-value uh, less than 0.05. And uh, this is hacking our results. So there are, uh, no, sorry, that's my environment. Uh, and there are ways to do that more, more correct way. Here I have a very, uh, here uh, I just did the normality test and the test with the correction. This is a Bonferroni correction. So I compensate for, and I see that already my p-values are larger. Some people that say that Bonferroni is too punishing, there are other ways to correct. The, this could, in this case, could be also done with ANOVA testing. Uh, the point is, is that we should be aware that uh, uh, testing multiple times and just reporting the p-values is simply wrong. And uh, as a minimum, we should try to compensate for it, describe it in the right way, and be conscious about it, that this uh, uh, changes our probabilities. And uh, I, I just have one last example that it's very short, but very important. You saw that till now, I only used two-sided tests. And there is a good reason for that, because if we uh, move from a two-sided to one-sided test, we, we should really have a base for that because it can, uh, don't go for it if you don't really have uh, the, the right information because it can really change our results. So this is a very uh, naive example. I, I just chose a sub data set from before and I repeated the same t-test as two-sided or one-sided from one side, one side from the other side. And uh, then I report the, the p-values. And here I have a couple of options you can write. And you can see that the, the differences are, are big. And um, and we should really have uh, the right info. So you see here, for example, in this other data set, I have 0 0.05 and 0 0.95, it's, it's huge. So I was a three-way uh, plan our test consciously or not do them at all. It's, it's, it's okay not to do them if it's not really confirmatory research. 
so to um, to conclude, I have uh, uh, one more very important slide. Oh, sorry. So um, this is all good. Oh, I think uh, also from the previous talks, uh, you should, if you didn't already know, you should, should realize that reporting p-values are not enough. Sometimes, even if you do everything right and the p-value is very low and it's uh, uh, it's right, you have planned everything right, it may be not enough because it may be not enough to show that the, there may be differences and that I can exclude the fact that there are no differences. It should be also a, a meaningful difference. And this we have a tendency to ignore or we don't really have the, the elements to say, but uh, um, uh, it's very nicely described in the textbook for medical statistics that uh, one thing is that the, the difference that is statistical. Another thing is that the clinical difference that lead us to choose one treatment and not another. And for this, we need much more or different information. So I hope I didn't get you to tell it. I, I just want to, to leave you with a few messages. Don't, don't follow the crowd. I, I have um, repeatedly received feedback or uh, personally or from colleagues that uh, my paper came back and the reviewers say, do some statistics. And uh, th th this is no solution. We shouldn't just do a t-test because uh, we have to do something. We should do it consciously. Uh, as a minimum, we should visualize the data properly before testing or doing anything. Tests have assumptions, even if we don't know them. So we should go and read further. If we do a test, we should do the appropriate test. And uh, it's, if we invent in the way, maybe we shouldn't be testing at all. Uh, we have all done it, I have done it, but we should be more conscious and more uh, more strong about how we report our results. And then the reviewers also uh, really respect it. I uh, thank you all for your time. And uh, I have seen some questions, but I, maybe we can pass the discussion. I will stop sharing now. So thank you very much, Xeni. I think we learned a lot and um, we now have this nice notebook to play around with. And we have some more questions in the chat, starting with Francesco's question. In the example where you add or subtract points, are the underlying distributions different or the same? I mean, was adding subtracting points getting us closer to the true result? So it was maybe a good thing? Uh, yeah. Now the, the distributions, uh, uh, of course, uh, change. Uh, change a little bit. In uh, in this case, there was distribution with a few points, so it didn't really change the the shape of the distribution. But uh, uh, I I I'm pretty sure that at least not reporting it does get us closer to to the true thing. And if the if we remove a point that the things change drastically, this is also something that shows us that maybe our uh, our experiment was not so uh, robust after all. And there was also another question on Giovanni: Are there practical ways to calculate the power of a test? Uh, honestly, I I don't. I don't, there could be, I, I don't know any. We, it's something we also at the end, we don't uh, really do very often our field because in principle, what we should do is uh, a sample, do a pilot study, have some points, get the effect size that we need and then go and do a, a power analysis. But uh, to, to my knowledge, there are a lot of tools out there to do it automatically. But you should do the the work the pre work. And Laura is asking, when reviewing manuscripts, what do you specifically look for, either in study design or figures, to ensure p hacking isn't happening? 
uh, one thing that it's very simple and people rarely do is they don't show the data so they and uh, that's uh, that's first thing i asked how, how was the distribution how was the data So as a reviewer, we should really ask the authors to uh, provide these plots of the data. Yeah, or is there a minimum to, to describe them? Because they, and then they, um, my, a second thing is that they, uh, they don't really know, very few people report the confidence intervals or the, any kind of intervals. And uh, then only with the p-value have very little information. So that's two things I, I always ask for. Yeah, we also heard that in the previous talks that we compute many more information than uh, the normal uh, researchers report. So not only p-values, but we should also report the other stuff and uh, really communicate our results better and it's not just a yes or no decision it's uh, it's uh, more complicated mm. and i think there is also much more information there and we actually no uh, um, so present the worst impression of our results and there is much more beauty there much more information and if we just saw the p-value then there is a lot of information lost and a lot of valuable information and another question by Giovanni. What do you mean with the more you repeat the testing, the more likely you will get a higher p-value? Do tests are repeated with the same sample or with different samples? Uh, yeah, this I, 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 I think theoretically it's meant more in the in you can see it in both two ways uh but it's uh it kind of happens of in in any dimension of it so if i if i draw samples again multiple times i, I sooner or later i, I will uh, if i keep testing for uh, uh this and this and parameter one parameter two parameter 42 at some point uh, something will come out uh, uh, significant and if I only report this then I completely change the image of my experiment but uh, also if yes if I draw again samples so if I um, scan this population and then the p-value was kind of okay and then I choose to scan again and add one and remove another and so the more tests we do the more uh, um, uh, the it's like in, uh, if I, it's like um, um, the, the factors multiply with each other and then the, my uh, chance of getting at the end something uh, uh, significant sooner or later, it's, uh, it's higher. But that's, uh, but that's why it's, uh, it's, it's very nice done in ANOVA that then can put my complete model of comparison there and compensate for p -values. But at the end, what I have seen for our field is uh, it's important because it changes the first glance of the paper. So instead of saying it was significant, you don't get significant because we've gone from it goes down to a different value. But at the end, most of the times, what we should do is we shouldn't test it, we should describe. And in nine out of 10 papers, that's the case. We should have never tested and we should have uh, described more results. Yeah, that's also what uh, Francesco was posting. So in his experience as, as a reviewer, uh, authors make a thousand comparisons and uh, correlating this with that and whatever, and they don't correct for anything. So they just hope to find something in the data and report this few results, uh, significant results that they get. Mm. And, uh, and some of the examples I, I presented are even with more samples than what we usually have in our field, because you people go and detest with uh, 
very few samples. And then the results are reproduced in the introduction of someone else who used the introduction of someone else, and then this information stays there forever. And we should, uh, um, we should be less tempted to, to use statistics, and when you use them, we should do more homework. So, yeah, so if there are no more questions. Thank you. Please go ahead and modify and use the tutorial. That's you. Please. So, so I uh, guess with that we come. Uh, can I yeah. just say something? I wanted to type, but uh, you're closing the session. I just wanted to say that uh, maybe in the Jupyter notebook, uh, uh, is it also possible to simulate two distributions that have same mean and standard deviation and do the same, uh, uh, the same analysis and see that the p-value maybe stays uh, very high for a long time, but in some cases it can dip below uh, our significant threshold. Uh, even so, even if two distributions are the same, uh, then uh, uh, by uh, sampling with few points, you can get uh, randomly uh, random uh, significant differences. I think it should be possible, Xenia, maybe. I think that's what you tried to show also in the first example. But you can uh, <laughs> you can freely change everything. So it's uh, I think the graphs of the p values are very really eye opening. And as Valerie mentioned, the, the, one of the first things we want will be also professors coming, dance of the values. Yeah, so to conclude our two sessions, uh, we should really accept that there is uncertainty and that there is failure, and we should really take care in which way we analyze our data and especially how we communicate our results. So thanks again for you all the participants and for the nice discussion and for our uh, speakers. And yeah, so enjoy the rest of the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.